All right. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for another Thursday night program. Um, we started these through COVID and have continued on because you all love them so much. So uh, tonight we have another great speaker. And for those of you tuning in, maybe for the first time, you are live with the Adams County Historical Society, and we are building our new Gettysburg Beyond the Battle Museum. And we're going to focus on stories of the civilians and the area around us, which is Adams County and the city of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Um, we're hoping or hoping and excited to be able to share some unknown stories that maybe have never seen the light of day before, especially inside our new museum, which is set to open very, very soon. We're very excited about that. But in the meantime, we've been doing these virtual programs every Thursday night. And I'm very excited tonight to have uh, Sue Boardman with us, licensed battlefield guide, and honestly, cyclo queen, all things Gettysburg. I love her to death. Tonight, she's gonna talk about monuments at Gettysburg. So Sue, I'm gonna have you take it away. All right, thank you, Abby. I'm I'm ex just as excited as you are about this this new project. I am dying to set foot in our brand new museum in Adams County. So that said, I'm going to talk tonight about monuments at Gettysburg, and my the title of my program is a legacy in granite and bronze. So to start off, I'd just like to read you a quote. There were many, many, many monument dedications, and some of the words. Some of the, the dedication speeches were very poignant and very profound. And this is just a short little quote from one of them. It said, for the visitor, these monuments, their emblems and legends that mournfully decorate this great battlefield from front to rear, from flank to flank, will become his interpreters and assistants. And, and that was uh, quoted at the first main cavalry monument dedication in 1889. And it pretty much sums up why I love monuments at Gettysburg, because they are the interpreters for us from what took place here at Gettysburg. So um, basically, David McConaughey, and let me, don't look at the screen yet, I'm not ready. Um, David McConaughey said, the battlefield itself is the best historical artifact attesting to the great battle. And I agree with him. David McConaughey, by the way, was a contemporary of the citizens in Gettysburg during the battle and was very instrumental in purchasing the first few plots of ground that became eventually the battlefield that you see today. Monuments are a specific component of this battlefield and are especially meaningful to me because they speak for the men who participated here at Gettysburg. They put them here. So they are a direct link to the past and one of the best interpretive tools available. So here's a, a picture of some veterans on Little Round Top. And on the top picture, you see um, a carving on a rock. And on the left, you see a very modest, small marker. 1878. The very first memorial on the battlefield proper was put on the battlefield. And by the way, the very first, first, first was the Minnesota urn. And I think I'll talk, talk, I mention it later, but this is the first one out in the battlefield. And it's 1878 because there was a reunion of Pennsylvania veterans that summer. And here are some of those veterans on Little Round Top. You see they're holding a, um, a portrait of Strong Vincent. And the little memorial they dedicated, which is right on the left edge of that group photograph, is the, the marker marking where Strong Vincent fell in the battle, mortally wounded. He's going to die a couple of days later. A little bit before that, in fact, probably quite a bit before that, was the, the carving on the rock that you see on the top right, which is interesting because a man from Erie, Pennsylvania, doing a battlefield tour in October of 1864, saw that rock carving, which tells us it's the true, true, legitimately first memorial per se on the battlefield of Gettysburg. And probably at the same time, there was one put on Little Round Top to weed where Weed and Hazlitt fell. But in any case, the first actually brought to the battlefield marker was marking where Strong Vincent passed. And that was in 18, or where he was mortally wounded. And that was 1878. That same summer, there were several others. These two in the top picture, you, you won't find this scene today because only one of them is there. It's to Merwin and Chapman of a Connecticut regiment marking where they fell. And down below Fred Taylor of the Bucktails, that's where he fell. Now, only one of these three is visible today because the Chapman marker was moved to the other side of the wheat field because when these were placed here in 78, the wheat field wasn't owned by the veterans. When it became part of the battlefield, the veterans moved the Chapman marker over to a more, um, a more accurate location. They didn't move the Merwin one because the regimental monument marked where he fell. So they just left the Merwin one there along the Wheatfield Road. 
Taylor had the same problem. They didn't own the location where he fell, but when it was eventually part of the park, they put up a different one and removed this one. So just so you know, the earliest monuments on the battlefield are to where beloved commanders fell in battle. Now, I mentioned the first true regimental marker is the one in the, in the um, cemetery to the first Minnesota that's pictured here on the right. But on the left is the first regimental level monument on the battlefield. If you know the hierarchy of um, how you build a, an army, the regiment is your smallest fighting unit. And the regiments at Gettysburg numbered over 400 and every one of them eventually would have a monument at Gettysburg. But the very first on the battlefield proper of a regimental monument placed by the Survivors Association in 1879 was the second Massachusetts over near Spangler Spring. That gentleman in the picture is a local citizen of Gettysburg named William Holtworth. He was a veteran of the battle itself, or sorry, a veteran of the war. He was in the campaign, but not at Gettysburg. And he is going to end up becoming one of the most famous battlefield guides, pre-government guides. The current licensed battlefield guide service was put in place by the War Department. But a lot of the veterans and locals did that job in the years before that force was put in place. And this one was Mr. Holtzworth was probably one of the most popular and well-known. He took some pretty important people, including presidents, out on the field. In any case, this is where the beginning of telling the story through monuments would would take place. So this is how the process worked. Here you see a couple of veterans of the 11th Pennsylvania standing up there on uh, Oak Ridge or at seminary, top of Seminary Ridge. Their monument stands up near that tower on Oak Hill. And they came to the battlefield at the request of Mr. Batchelder, the superintendent of battles of, of tablets and legends, self-appointed historian of the battlefield. He is going to invite each regiment in turn to come back to the field, take them to the spot where they started the battle. That's important, where they started the battle, not where they ended up. And he would drive a stake and the stake would look like what you see down here in the bottom right had a number. He would assign it a number and then put that number in his ledger. This is where the 11th Pennsylvania stood at whatever time on July 1, 1863. So that was how they were first marked. From there, it went to putting signs on trees that gave the regiment, the brigade, the division, and the corps. And some, in some, so you see several of those right here in these pictures. You would come to the battlefield, and that's what you'd see marking the battlefield. And some states, including New York and Massachusetts, put up very early iron and bronze tablets that look like these. But these all gave way to the monumentation itself. So it starts mostly with Pennsylvania units, simply because they began to reunion at Gettysburg starting in the summer of 1871, and they will come back twice, twice a year minimum to the field. So 1878, you got those death markers, but then in starting in early, in the early to mid 1880s, you start to see actual regimental monuments like the like the second Massachusetts. So here's the 20th Maine came in 1886. They're going to jump on because Pennsylvania started to actually monument the field. Here on the right in 1885, the 140th Pennsylvania. Notice how they look. We refer to monuments like this as very funerary. They're not here to talk about the grandeur of the battle or the awesomeness of the unit. They were here mainly to honor the dead and to honor their service. So you see these very somber and funerary looking markers that just have some text on it telling what happened. This is how it began, but this is going to kind of blow the lid off veterans coming back to mark the field. So as the 25th reunion approached in the mid to late 1880s, many state legislatures began to encourage veterans by contributing money toward monuments. So those are the ones you see on the battlefield that have state seals on them. Notice this one over here on the left is the 150th PA, and that's why the Pennsylvania State Seal is there. They use the $1,500 that Pennsylvania State gave to each, and, and they had a lot of regiments. That cost Pennsylvania a lot of money. They have 69 regiments in this battle. Here you see New York, again, a state seal, which tells you this regiment was in part at least, paid for by the money given by the state of New York. The first state to do this was Massachusetts, but pretty soon all but two states will actually give money to their veterans. So now with, with the beginning of monumentation, Mr. Batchelder decided that 
there had to be some kind of design to this. You can't just start throwing up monuments that say anything because for one thing, a lot of veterans wanted their monument where they were closest to the Confederate line, where they did something spectacular. And it, it, it would be really kind of messy looking. It has no symmetry, no design. So he decided that the monuments had to be placed on the battle line. But then he started to lay out some other rules so that there was a uniformity. So here are the rules, the main ones. There were others, but these are the main ones that more or less um, informed what a monument was going to look like under Mr. Batchelder's jurisdiction as superintendent of tablets and legends. So we're going to look at these in turn to show you how they're displayed on the monuments. But the first one was probably one of the most important. On the front of, of every state monument must appear the number of the regiment, the state, the brigade, the division, and the corps in letters not less than four inches tall. It was also um, recommended that the corps badge and the state seal had to appear on them as well. So let's look at a couple of monuments that, that displayed these particular points. Now, first of all, again, I told you about the Army's organization. So you have Army Corps Division Brigade, all of which have text tablets on the battlefield, which were placed there by the War Department in 18, or yeah, starting about 1895, but more a little bit after that because they had to kind of get a grip on their job first. But in any case, the core badges are appear here on the left, first, second, third, fifth, sixth, 11th, and 12th. The ones that are missing are on some other battlefield of the war in some other theater. And the color is just as important, although not so much to monuments. However, we will see a couple of colored um, core badges, but basically the color denotes the division. So red, white, and blue, first, second, and third division of the core. So just that's just your guide to, to see how it's starting to be played out in monuments. So first core, here we have the 97th Pennsylvania. They simply put a circle on the top with their number 97, but notice the tall letters. 97th New York, 2nd Brigade, 2nd Division, 1st Corps. It didn't have to be quite that blatant. You have, Sometimes you have to walk around the monument to see all that information, but it has to be there. And there is the State Seal of New York. Here on the right, you have a Michigan monument. This happens to be the 24th Michigan. So there's their Corps badge placed prominently above their battle flags. And here you have the 1st Iron Brigade, 1st Division, 1st Corps. 2nd Corps. This is the 7th Michigan. You look, you can see very prominently displayed the core badge and the state seal of Michigan. There's the letters denoting who they belong to. And this is one of my favorites for displaying the core badges in a very artful fashion. The 106th Pennsylvania put three drums on their side to depict their second core badge. I think that's very artful. The, the Union Third Corps, here we have the 4th Maine and the 7th, 17th Maine. And here's a colored core badge. A few of the regiments decided to actually depict their core badge in the correct color. It was easy to do with, with the red because there was a lot of pink and red granite available. The blue was a different matter. You're going to see one or two with some blue ones on there too. But in any case, this is the third core. The fifth core, here you have some regiments. Both of them are Pennsylvania regiments. And they are depicting the second Pennsylvania reserves and the ninth PA reserves. You have see the, all the appropriate letters. You see the core badges, one huge on the left, one kind of subtle on the right, and you see the Pennsylvania State Seal. Sixth Corps, the old Greek cross. Here's a blue one. This was inlaid to the stone. It was not made out of granite itself. It was inlaid in the stone. And this is the 23rd Pennsylvania, again, the state seal. And we'll talk a little bit later about if the Survivor Association put an early monument up that didn't have these um, rules to conform to, sometimes they had to add parts to the monument to bring it up to conformity. And this is gonna be one of them we'll talk about in a little bit later. And you see the red core badge here on the 119th regiment, that is the 119th Pennsylvania. And by the way, on that one, did you notice the keystone? Okay, here we have the 11th core of the Crescent Moon. And this on the left is your 68th regiment. Sorry, no, it isn't. Sorry, no, it isn't. It's Pennsylvania. And on the right, the 73rd Pennsylvania. Again, you see the prominent writing. This one was the 27th. Both of them belonging to the 11th Corps. And here's our 12th Corps, 3rd Wisconsin. 
and the 60th New York. Both of these are over on Colts Hill, and both of them, again, display here on the very top, the core badge. The core badge was at first a, a method for um, officers to be able to find their troops in the chaos of battle, but it turned out to have kind of a side effect that wasn't anticipated that was really cool. It gave the units an esprit de corps. So it became a kind of a badge of honor. Oh, I belong to this core or I belong to that core. So putting the core badges on the monuments was kind of a no brainer by the time they became veterans. Now, the uh, another um, rule, the statue or figure of a soldier, if it appears on your monument, not all did, but some did, must face the enemy or the Confederate side. So it may explain to you a lot of things like why this, the monument doesn't appear to be facing the road when the road is where the people viewing the monument would be. It's not about you so much as about being an accurate depiction of the soldier on the unit, on, on, the, on the monument. So here you see a picture on the left of the 78th, 102nd New York on Culp's Hill. You notice that the palm fronds are on this one, but not on this one. It's because the palm fronds are on the other side which the visitor today has to intentionally look for because the road going by this monument is a one way. So the palm fronds, you would have to go up the road and then turn around and look at it. So this monument shows you on the first one, it almost was parallel with the breastworks and then it was changed to turn 90 degrees and actually face the breastworks. And there it de actually depicts breastworks, which is really neat. It's just overlooking the actual breastworks. Here's another one. If you ever drove on Doubleday Avenue up on the first day's battlefield along the road, here's the road. As you can see, the road appears to be behind the monument or, or maybe I should put it the other way around. The monument is backwards to the road, which is true, but it's because the soldier on the top fronts toward the enemy line. So this is the one that has Sally the dog, the 11th Pennsylvania. And it's kind of ironic that a lot of people drive past this monument and don't see Sally because she's actually at the base on the front of the monument. So you'd have to park, get out and walk around to see her. Now, another rule is monuments must be made only of granite or bronze or a combination of these materials. One of the reasons this was put on the books was because there was already some early monuments placed on the field. One was to Cooper's Battery. Another one was a monument in the Peach Orchard that was ma were made out of marble. This is 27th Pennsylvania on the right over on Coster Avenue. It used to stand on Cemetery Hill because this is the Regimental Survivors Monument. They got money, so they put up a different one on Cemetery Hill and moved this one to a secondary position where they went out to cover the retreat of on the first day's battle. So on the left, Cooper's Battery, there was inscriptions all around the top of this monument, totally unable to be read just within a few years because marble's so soft. So that was already becoming obvious to the to Batchelder and, and the folks on the field. So it was a rule that marble was not a good choice and that the only enduring things would be granite and bronze. So things had to be made out of granite and bronze. Now there was a small exception because some some really slick talking um, salesmen, oh, by the way, this is one in the peach orchard. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to skip this guy. Um, this one on, in the peach orchard is I believe the 62nd, 68th, sorry, 68th Pennsylvania, again, it's nearly impossible to read because it's made out of, of um, marble. Now, this case, a, a swift talking salesman came by to the GBMA board. That's the board of the veterans who managed the battlefield from 1864 until 1895. Actually, the veterans themselves took over about 1878. Up until then, it was the local folks, but nothing happened during those years. So 1870 something to 1895, the veterans are in charge of the field under the auspices of the Gettysburg Battlefield Memorial Association. And they're going to hear from a, a salesman who's selling, quote, white bronze. It's actually zinc. It's a zinc monument with some other kinds of alloys in it. And they, they postulated to the board of the GBMA that these this would last for centuries. So the GBMA allowed the 8th Ohio to use white bronze on their for their monument that went up in 1887. It didn't take terribly long before it started to lean because the, ele the elements, it, it didn't hold up in the elements. So for a lot of us in our current generation, when we came to the battlefield over the, over the years, 
this monument looked like the middle picture. It had no guy on top because the monument was leaning and they took the top piece off. So thanks to a really awesome guy by the name of Lucas Flickinger, who was our superintendent of monument maintenance, he put a, a structure inside of that large, tall column piece and put it back up so that it won't lean anymore. But this monument is the reason why, one of the reasons why um, you don't see any more zinc monuments on the battlefield. They did not hold up. Granite, granite and bronze were the preferred um, material. Now that didn't specify what kind of granite. So you have a lot of kinds of granite on the battlefield. You got coarse, you got fine in between, Vermont granite, New Hampshire granite, New England of all kinds of granite. But you also have this really awesome granite that came from the state of Wisconsin. There is a stripe of pink granite that goes from Montana all the way down to Texas. And in Montello, Wisconsin, they um, quarried this granite and all the Wisconsin regimental monuments are made from Montello granite. So, so in some cases, it's very fine, like you see on the left where the inscription is really easy to read. But here over on the right is a very coarse version of the same pink granite. And when you read it, sometimes you have to stand at a certain angle to be able to pick out the lettering because it's not quite as sharp. In any case, you see on the bottom, this is from the granite company out of Montello, Wisconsin. That's why all the Wisconsin regimental monuments have pink granite on them. Now, another rule, effective strength and casualty figures, if actively engaged, must conform to the official records of the War Department. You may be familiar with that massive 138 volume set of official records of the War of the Rebellion that was published through the War Department. So if so, so what happens if you put up a monument and you put up the numbers you think were legitimate, maybe Fister or one of those other guys who kept numbers early on, and then Batchelder comes along with a volume of the official record and says, um, the numbers you carved on your monument don't agree. So then what are you going to do? Your options are fix your monument or amend the War Department numbers which literally in this case would have taken an act of Congress. So in most cases, what the veterans ended up doing was adding bronze tablets over top of the cut car, uh, carved granite so that they could bring their monument up to speed. In this particular monument to the 5th New Hampshire that's over there above Devil's Den, if you go up to this monument and look, see where the 5th New Hampshire um, panel is in the front. Look to the right panel and you can see the carving underneath peeking through that it's obvious that these were put on here to cover something else. What they were designed to do was to bring the numbers up to speed. So it's kind of unfortunate that it, that had to be done, but that was one of the requirements and conformity was required. Another monument that you'll see on the battlefield that well, had to do this, and this is one of the early, this is the first New York monument, the 124th that stands above Devil's Den, the Orange Blossoms. This monument was extremely early on the battlefield. It was put up in July of 1884. And just as an aside, three weeks later, it was vandalized. And that's why today you see the figure of Van Horn Ellis up on top there has a bronze sword. It's because the original sword was broken off by vandalism. But in any case, the plaques on the monument itself were designed to bring this up to speed so that it um, presents all the necessary information to the public, the visiting public. So now another rule, monuments have, must have a suitable inscription showing its historic historical relation to the battle regarding its time and service. A lot of people drive along the battlefield and don't often get out of their car. But if you were to get out of the car and walk along these monuments and go around the other three sides, not just the side facing the road, you will find an incredible amount of information, including what they did there. Basically, this monument is telling you absolutely everything you want to know. This regiment stood here. This belonged to the, this brigade, this division, this corps. It did this at this time on this day. All of that information is on all of these um, state monuments that were placed on the battlefield by the veterans. So let me show you one in particular that if you've never got out and read it, you may be shocked to see what it says on the back. Here is the Crossroads Monument. The 142nd Pennsylvania built their monument to show you that they fought at the crossroads of Gettysburg. It has very minimal information on the front. You can see all the necessary stuff, though, who they were, what regiment, brigade, division, et cetera, the core badge, the state seal. 
but go around the back and you have half a textbook there. It tells you everything they did on that spot. And even later on, see here at the bottom, they said on July 2nd, they retired to Cemetery Hill and to, some, to Cemetery Ridge and then Hill on July 3rd. So all that information is written on that monument, but you can't tell unless you get out and look. Another rule, primary monuments must be placed in a position the regiment held in line of battle. This particular rule caused a little bit of problem. And the last list on the rules tells you why. The location of the monument and the inscription must be approved by the GBMA before the erection of the monument could take place. And that is where we ran into some trouble with some monuments. Here's why. Here's a, a look at three Massachusetts monuments that were placed where they rushed to the copse of trees on July 3rd when Kemper's Brigade hit the 69th Pennsylvania in that location. These particular regimental mon regiments, in other words, came to the aid of, of the 69th there at the copse. So Massachusetts being the earliest state to give money, I think it was 1883, they started to give money to their, to their regiments. Uh, so by 1885 and six, Massachusetts was putting up regimental monuments. Now remember the rules are 87. So these go in before the monument, before the monument rules. So here they are at the angle. Now Batchelder comes along and says, uh, they're not where you started the battle. You were in a line of battle. You probably noticed as you drive the battlefield that monuments are in rows, which reflect the linear battle tactics of the day. So these Massachusetts monuments are not where these particular units started the battle. So what happens? Batchelder had them moved and Massachusetts sued over it. They were very upset, but they didn't exactly prevail, but there was a compromise. And the compromise was that Massachusetts had to move their monuments back, back into or into their line of battle, but they were permitted to put these bronze tablets where their advanced positions were. And this is gonna happen with some other regiments as well, but, th but this one is kind of a pretty prominent example of the rule and, and how they had to deal with it. So all three of those regiment regimental monuments are now in the line, two of them at the front line, one of them in the support line on the other side of Hancock Avenue. Now, here's some other ones that were changed so if you um, if you have your state, if you were a, reg, a survivor's association and you put up an early monument at Gettysburg, like here on the left, 1883, the 91st Pennsylvania is going to put up this modest little monument. Now, state money comes along and wow, you can do a lot more. So they're going to put up this castle on Little Round Top. And they're now in this case, what do they do with the little one? They didn't have another location that they chose to put another monument. So they repurposed it by adding the inscriptions citing that Weed and Hazlitt fell on this location and moved it to that location. So if you go to the big castle and turn around and walk a couple feet toward the, the, you know, the other side, the east side, you will find this monument with different engraving on it. It's pretty interesting. Uh, the picture I showed you here on the right doesn't have the ball on top. Um, Lucas Flickinger has made sure that all these little small acts of vandalism have are remedied. So now this monument has the ball back on top. Um, another case, the 93rd Pennsylvania put a monument in Weikert's Lane. This was an early monument. It's gonna get there in um, the mid 1880s. They're gonna get state money. And by the way, see the pretty um, mosaic blue core badge that they put in their monument. They're gonna move their monument to a secondary location and put their state monument that you see here on the right in the location of their primary spot on the line. This is a July 2nd position. And you'll notice that it sat on a boulder that had carved what brigade division and corps they belong to and the date. Well, when they put the state monument, it was so large, they had to cut the boulder down. So you can walk around that boulder and see the cut off pieces of it because the information that was on the boulder is now, now appears on the front of the state monument. So just a cool thing to do, get out, walk up Weikert's Lane to this monument and check it out. And um, by the way, the, the flags on the front of that are taken after a picture of their actual state flags. This is 155th up on Little Round Top. Everybody knows it as that Zouave guy that stands below General Warren. You can see Warren in the right-hand picture back there in the background. This monument now is kind of lost in the trees. It often gets hit with a tree and gets broken. 
But in any case, state money came along after the monument was in place. They didn't have another location to put this, the regimental monument. So all they did was enhance it. They used the money to add the entire top portion on the monument showing the zoo off. So that's so you can either move your monument and put a new one in its original location, or you can just fix it up and make it fancier, which is what some of them did. State of New Jersey, 12th New Jersey has this monument on the line on Hancock Avenue, just a little bit south of the um, Bryan Barn. And this was an early monument. It was placed up here in 1886. And when they got state money, they added an entire piece. You notice they lifted it up and they, first of all, they carved their brigade divisions uh, and the information, necessary information there, but also notice that they put in the bar relief showing their action on July 3rd at the Bliss Farm. So that's sometimes just an example of the enhancement they would do when they got money, but they didn't really need to replace their monument. So this, this is a pretty neat one. That is a beautiful bar relief of the, of the 12th, along with their Delaware and Connecticut friends torching the barn that morning to run the Confederate sharpshooters out. This is a, another interesting example. This is the 23rd Pennsylvania over on Culp's Hill. It was paid for by the veterans initially. So when their, when their money came along, they didn't have a secondary position to move it to. So they, again, enhanced their monument. They're going to put the state seal up here on the top. You can see how they added a piece, the, the, actually the base of where the zoob is standing will now hold the state seal. And they replaced this collection of balls, which I found interesting because to me, if I saw that, I would think that was an artillery unit but it's actually, they had the 69 caliber smooth bore, so that was their bullet. And they're gonna take that off and put the zoov on top. And look to the right on the ground, of, on, on the right-hand picture, you see that this picture was, ca was capturing about the time they did this, this change, because there stands the, the pyramid of balls on the ground next to the monument. The 147th Pennsylvania are mostly German, a lot of them Pennsylvania German, and you may know a Pennsylvania German, and you may know that that Pennsylvania German is extremely thrifty and doesn't waste anything. So up on the top left is their, is their Survivors Association monument placed there in 1885. And when the state money comes along in 87, it didn't take a lot of imagination. They took away their three foot star and they put a five foot star in its place, but not wishing to waste that three foot star, they erased the inscription, flipped it around and made it into a core badge. So, or I'm sorry, a flank marker. So the flank marker on the right side of this monument, your left as you're facing it, it looks like a star, but the other, the other flank marker on the left just looks like every other flank marker, which is just a small shaft. It's kind of odd, but that's why it looks like that. And by the way, flank markers were a, a recommendation by the GBMA to, to show where your, your regimental line stood from end to end. So the right flank marker would stand where the rightmost man in line stood and the left flank marker would stand where the leftmost man in line. The regimental monument would tend to be in the center. And then you've got an idea of how big their line was. So it was pretty cool, but this is the only one that has a weird shaped right flank marker and that's the reason. So let me show you some pictures uh, how the monuments depict the branch of service and other unique features that you might see depicted that refer specifically to a, a certain unit and some common themes and symbols that appear on monuments. So cavalry, cavalry has some beautiful monuments. Now they didn't have a core badge, they had their own symbol, which you see graces the top of this New York um, cavalry monument. This is the ninth New York. And this is said to be one of the most perfect depictions of a cavalryman. You notice how he's, how he's got his specific musket, a breech loader, or, sorry, rifle. He's got all the accoutrements of the soldier. So if you want to see what an actual soldier at Gettysburg who was in the cavalry look like, this is a really awesome monument to point out. Now, there are other depictions of it, in, including this one. This is the 6th New York Cavalry. And you notice that it shows a battle of clashing sabers, which was interesting because that was the way the cavalry, I mean, they had muskets. You know, it was very cavalier-like to have these these views of these close up fighting things, but 
most of the time, by the time of Gettysburg, these cavalrymen were using their muskets and they were not, or the rifles, and they were not at this close range. This was the romanticized version of the cavalry. Now, um, the artillery had monuments, as it has monuments as well. They are going to follow a lot of the same rules, but depict their work as cavalry, as artillerymen. This one's a pretty special one. This 15th New York shows the ramrod that they would have used to draw, to push the ordnance into the barrel of the gun, of the cannon. It has the state seal of New York. They, these were required to follow most of the same rules. Here is a really cool one belonging to Thompson's battery that stands in the peach orchard. Imagine the piece of granite carved, carved like a cannon. It's pretty cool. Um, up there on the top is truly a monument just like the others. It's a cannon barrel that has a plaque on it telling you that that is the first artillery piece that fired in the Battle of Gettysburg, serial number 233. The, the, a lot of the all of the artillery units are also depicted not only by a monument, but by a set of guns, usually four guns on the field depicting a Union six gun battery and two guns representing a Confederate four gun battery. So they are also marking the field where so they're part of the memorialization of the field. Here is a skirmisher, a specific type of soldier function. So he's got his gun in the position of a skirmisher. This is the 111th New York by the Bryan Farm. And the Chaucer, which represents the 14th Brooklyn, notice it didn't say the 14th New York because there was a militia unit belonging to the 14th Brooklyn and they rolled into becoming the 84th New York Regiment in the Union First Corps. So when you walk up to this one, you'll see two of these round medallions. One will be the New York State Seal, but the other one is the City of Brooklyn Seal. It's the only one that represents its city. And it's a Chaucer, not a Zouave. I found that out the hard way when I referred to a, I, I said in front of a reenactor, I called him a Zouave and he set me straight rather quickly. So don't make that mistake. This is a Chaucer, not a Zouave. You'll see flags on regimental monuments. The flag is the most important tool in, for communication in the regiment. The flag bearers are the ones who more or less direct the movement of the regiment once the chaos of battle ensues. You can't hear um, verbal orders, but you can certainly see your colors. So of course, that was also a, a major target on, on the, from the enemy perspective. But in any case, the, the colors are represented here and represent the color bear. So I mentioned the 139th Pennsylvania, how they put their colors. This is a photograph, a CDV, a period photograph of their colors. You see them in a tattered condition. So the back one is the original uh, flag and the front is their replacement flag. And you see that they were very faithfully recreated on their monument at Gettysburg. It's pretty neat, right down to the battle honors written on the red stripes. Sorry, this is 93rd, not the 139th. I'm sorry, I misspoke on that. Uh, this is another one representing the flag, the 4th Michigan. There's a great story connected to that of Colonel Jeffords grabbing the flag as the color bearer was shot down and he himself will be bayoneted and the person, the Confederate who bayoneted him will immediately be shot down as well. On the right here, we have Ben Crippen with the 143rd Pennsylvania. His actions of shaking his fist at the Confederates as he was ordered to withdraw from the field will go down in the report of a Confederate officer. He'll talk about the defiant um, color bearer on the, uh, on the Union side. By the way, Ben Crippen um, was killed in action. This is the 74th uh, Pennsylvania. And you see that he's dejected. They have lost, they have had to retreat. And on the right is an interesting way to show the colors. It's the colors furled which is what you do at the end of the battle when you place your colors at rest, you furl the, the fabric around the flagstaff. In this case, they're furled around the guns. What this regimental monument is telling the observer is it's over, we have stacked our guns and furled our flags. And you see the core badge there on the front. This was a very expensive monument because it's solid bronze. Uh, here's colors on the 16th Michigan. 16th Michigan is up by the a Double Day Inn on the battlefield. And those battle, those colors were especially poignant to these men because they tore up their colors when it appeared they were going to be overrun on July 1. Here on the right, you also have colors depicted. That's the first Minnesota. They lost more men than any other unit in a single action on the field. And here is the Irish flag on the 28th Massachusetts. 
there is the green, there's, there's controversy over whether the flag was indeed green, but as you see on the monument on the right, the flag on the right, you see the harp depicted in granite. The, um, here's the 24th Michigan, their battle colors are on there. The 5th Ohio is interesting. They show their flag draped over their, their um, rifle and the words, boys keep the colors up, which was the last words spoken by their colonel at the Battle of Chancellorsville when he fell in battle and died. So it, that's honoring him the way they depicted those colors. And this is an interesting story about colors is the 149th New York. Not only were their colors an interesting part of the monument, their whole monument was an interesting conversation. On the left is their original monument that they dedicated on the battlefield of Gettysburg. But they claimed that it, the contract was not um, exactly adhered to and they didn't like the way the monument came out. So they rejected it. And two years later, they'll put up the monument on the right. But they had a lot of time to think about what this monument was going to look like since they obviously knew what they didn't want it to look like. So on the monument, you see a bar relief. And here is a, a close up of it. They ask the famous illustrator, Edwin Forbes, to depict the action of the 149th on July, actually the night of the second and the morning of the third, which showed them this picture, this actual illustration is of the third though, because there's Ben Crippen in the very front, I'm sorry, not Ben Crippen, uh, William Lilly, who was the color bearer of the 149th. And you see that he's repairing the colors under fire. He actually, this, this flag was pierced about 88 times. The flag staff was hit at least 11 times and at one point shattered in half. So Crippen under fire is, is shown here, mending the flag staff by using slats from a cracker box and straps from a, a haversack. So he's mending the colors. And so that was asked to be depicted in this artwork, which then was transferred or kind of, you know, it was used as a basis for the bas relief. That and the showing how they use the breastworks. So to such good effect on the battlefield of Gettysburg. So that was an interesting addition to the 149th. Th these are two other uh, depictions of flags. Sometimes you have to really look closely. This is just showing a kind of a severed oak tree that has, it's, a flag, it's draped in a flag and a wreath. And it's kind of hard to pick out that kind of detail unless you really study these monuments. Uh, trees, by the way, are used to depict strength. So here's the 37th Mass and the 90th Pennsylvania, also using oak trees as their the basis of their monument and then added their accoutrements to it. Now, there's a lot of really cool symbolism, but some of my favorite involves the flora that appears on monuments. There's prominently displayed oak leaves, which stand for strength, laurel leaves, which stand for victory, and palm leaves, which strand, stands for peace and resurrection, but mostly peace when you see it depicted on a monument on a battlefield. So you're, once you're aware of these things, as you travel the battlefield, it's hard to notice monuments that don't have it because about just under 50% of the monuments at Gettysburg bear one or more versions of these flora. If they're often lost in the artwork, but now that you know about them, they're probably gonna stick out prominently to you. So let me show you a few examples. This is the... Um, the 12th Massachusetts up on the first day's field and notice the oak leaves, the polished oak leaves that are under the medallion of um, Webster. That's by the way, Daniel Webster, his son Fletcher was in the unit and died in a previous battle. Here on the right, you have the Ohio boys, the fourth, and there is Laurel. You can tell the Laurel mostly by the, by the um, berries in the, in the depiction. So here is a palm leaf. There's the third one. The palm, this one is on the 11th Pennsylvania. And here the, next to it, you have the 45th New York that has laurel on it. And it just goes on and on and on. Here on the top, 7th Ohio. Here on the bottom, the 43rd New York. And a close up here on the right, you see the beautiful laurel wreath on this one. It's the 137th New York. It, it's just it's just almost like it's a necessary part of the symbolism, but it isn't obvious. So unless it's pointed out to you, sometimes it's hard to notice. Here we have the um, seventh Michigan, and this one has laurel on it. And over here on the right is interesting. Some of the regimental monuments depict um, like this first Massachusetts artillery, two types. You have the palm on one side and the laurel on the other. Here is the 90th 
Pennsylvania, 90, yeah, the 90th Pennsylvania that stands in Ziegler's Grove. And on this one, you see both oak on the right and laurel on the left, just as you see on this one on the right is the 16th Maine. You have the laurel and the oak as well. Those two seem to be combined pretty frequently. And this one's my favorite, Hampton's Battery put all three. Here at the top, you have laurel. Here in the middle, you have palm. And here on the sides, you have clusters of oak leaves. So they wanted you to know all about the peace, the victory, and the strength of the unit. Here's the ninth mass battery, just kind of leading into the fact that the ninth mass battery had Palm and Laurel on their main monument over on Wheatfield Road. This regiment has three monuments um, and you see one of them here, it's just an ordnance chest. That's one of them. They have a third one, which is right here in Ziegler's Grove. And the interesting thing about the ninth mass battery, it marked all three of its places, three of its um, positions on the field. But what's most interesting to me is that their bugler, Charles Reed, went on after the war to become a pretty well-known artist. And he's the one who designed all three of their monuments, as well as the lion uh, honoring the first Vermont brigade at Gettysburg that stands back on Wright Avenue. So all of those three um, ninth, math, ninth, ninth Mass and the Lion, all created by Bugler Charles Reed. By the way, he got a Medal of Honor from his work at Gettysburg. Eagles, you see eagles. Eagles, eagle, an eagle represents the, um, more or less the emblem or the, I don't want to use the word mascot, that sounds kind of weird, but the emblem of the United States. So you see eagles gracing many monuments. Here is the, uh, one in the wheat field and the one, this is the other, one of the other ninth, ninth Pennsylvania, yeah, 90th Pennsylvania. They have actually three monuments, one on each day because they fought on it all three days. This is their state monuments. Sorry, their state monument is on Oak Ridge. This is the survivor's monument. And today it's repaired where you see that little hole in the middle that now has the buck and ball back in it. That's thanks to Mr. Flickinger. Here are more eagles, beautiful eagles. I love the 88th here on the left, 88th Pennsylvania, the 139th PA is here on the top and the Vermont Sharpshooter, which is over in Pittsburgh's woods that was destroyed by a storm and completely recreated. But the um, eagle on it was replaced, the eagle is, is original to the monument. Here are many others in bronze, depictions of bronze eagles on many, many monuments. It's pretty cool. I like the ones that stand on the ball. I think that's pretty cool. Um, dogs, we have dogs on the monument, two, twice. The one on the right, of course, is Sally with the 11th Pennsylvania. She was a real dog that was here on the battlefield with her unit. Um, was separated from the unit for a while, but rejoined them and was with them right to the end at Hatcher's Run where she was killed in battle. Here on the left though, this dog, the Irish Wolfhound is actually a symbol, the symbol of loyalty and devotion. And interestingly, it, it's gracing an Irish monument, Irish immigrants from New York. So they're displaying loyalty and devotion, not to their home country, but to the, their adopted country. The aftermath of battle is not often depicted on monuments because monuments mostly depict battle action, but there are several that depict the aftermath. And this is one of my favorites, the first Long Island Volunteers over on Culp's Hill. It's the 67th New York. And you see the soldier standing at funeral rest with his, his uh, the butt of his gun pointing up and the barrel pointing down into the rear. And you see all around him, the debris of battle and the, the little inscription underneath the soldier, it says, it is over. So that one depicts the end of the battle. Another one that does that is the 86 New York over above Devil's Den. And this shows a, wo a woman, it may be a sister, a mother or a wife. And it's, she's saying, I yield him unto his country and his God. So again, depicting the aftermath, he's fallen in battle. A third one on the field that depicts aftermath is the 9th Pennsylvania Reserves. It shows a soldier bending, his, bowing his head over the grave of his comrade, which is right here. And it's, it's just by a comrade's grave is what it's depicting. So those are the three main ones. I did point out the um, 56 Pennsylvania with the furled, the stacked muskets in the furled flags, again, depicting the aftermath. So here's just a couple of monuments that talk, that show some real interesting stuff. I explained to you about Brooklyn, the 14th Brooklyn. Here is that seal of the city of Brooklyn on one side. And you see that the state seal of New York is on the front simply because the state paid for that for it, but they represent, the, or they did before they became part of the 84th, 
they actually depicted this, they were representing the city of Brooklyn. Here is an interesting monument to the 20th Indiana. Their early monument is on the left. You notice it was very brief in its inscription. It just says the 20th Regiment Indiana Volunteers and the date. When it was spruced up a bit, they added that Colonel John Wheeler was killed nearby. Now, the reason that didn't appear on the original monument was because across the road from this monument was a boulder upon which was painted the inscription, Colonel John Wheeler, 20th Indiana, killed in action on, and he was killed on that spot. So once graffiti was ordered to be removed from the battlefield in 1887, sometimes if the information on the on the graffiti was important enough, it was added to the monument. And in this case, that's that was the, the case with the 20th uh, Indiana. So you can still find that boulder today, right across the road, it's kind of lost in the weeds sometimes, but the inscription from it was added to the monument. Uh, one of the, another part of a symbolism that appears on monuments is something called a fasces, F-A-S-C-E-S, and it's this particular symbolism right here circled. And what it is, is a, it's a bundle of rods lashed together with leather and embedded in it is an ax handle. Its meaning is strength through unity. The unity, of course, is the, bun, is the rods lashed together and the strength is the ax head. It appears right here in this picture on the Lincoln Speech Memorial that was dedicated in 1912. And you see it's on either side of the bronze tablets, one tablet depicting the Gettysburg Address and the other tablet, the words that Wills wrote to Lincoln inviting him to come and give a few appropriate remarks at the dedication of the cemetery. So it's a very important and prominent symbolism, military symbolism going all the way back to Roman times. So strength through unity, this is Cincinnatus, this statue right here, and you see that he's holding it. And this stands actually in Cincinnati, Ohio. There's another depiction of it right here on the right on the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, DC, the arms of the chair. Lincoln's both hands are over, uh, over top of these two facets. And here on the bottom is a mercury dime. And there it is again. And there's another prominent use of it at Gettysburg in the 1938 reunion. This is the symbol. You see the Confederate and the Union flag, and right in the middle, there is that symbol. We do not use it anymore because it was adopted by the fascists during the um, World War II. So it was given a negative connotation and no longer thought to be used prominently in modern military symbolism. By the way, in the same symbol, do you see the oak leaves? and the laurel leaves also gracing those legs. Here is a cool story on a monument. This is the 80th New York, also known as the 20th New York State Militia. That was who they were, their identity before they were rolled into becoming a New York regiment. And on it, you see the right hand of Ulster. And the, around it is the words, uh, or not around it, but on the monument, it says uh, this right hand, right there it is, this hand for our country. It's a it's a, a reference back to the right, the red hand of Ulster that you see depicted on these two flags. And it was a, a part of mythology that um, there was a Celtic king who desired to give his land to two people. They were rivals and each one wanted to claim Ulster. So the story had it that they were told that they had to go there and actually claim it by laying, laying claim to it by touching the land. So the competition was close. They got they got within within sight of the land, and at one point, one competitor lops off his right hand and throws it onto the land to claim it. So that's the origins of the right hand of Ulster, and here it is depicted on the monument. This monument is said to honor, although I've read lately some controversy about the origins of this story, but the story claims that their Colonel, Joseph Paul Revere, the, the grandson of Paul Revere, was killed at Gettysburg, all that's true, but the controversy comes in the point of the monument. It is said that this, this conglomerate stone was brought from Boston, which 
indeed it was, but they say that the reason it was brought was to honor Revere because he played around this stone growing up as a boy. That's the part that is controversial, whether that's a true story or not. It's a cool story, and that's why the stone looks like it does. It was brought from Boston, and it does represent a lot of the type of rock you find there called a conglomerate stone. It has a lot of pebbles in it and stuff. So does def definitely represent the state of Massachusetts and whether or not it was placed there to just specifically honor um, their colonel is now up for interpretation. This is the 29th Ohio. And the only interesting thing particularly about this monument is that the cartridge box depicted here in the opening of the tent has a reversed S on the badge, on the, the cartridge box plate. No one knows why it's reversed. Um, a lot of people attribute it that to the fact that a lot of stone carvers were illiterate and he just simply reversed it. Um, that's a very plausible answer. It's probably not because they used a daguerreotype, which shows a reverse or tin type, which shows a reversed image, because then the U would be on the other side if that were the case. So it, you know, totally up for conversation why there's a reversed S on that cartridge box plate. This is a cool story of the 7th Ohio. Again, if you get out of your car, and go around to the other side, opposite the side that has the Ohio State seal, you will see another medallion depicting a gamecock. And there, they also it's called a rooster. These unit, this unit adopted the gamecock as their mascot. So they actually wore a pin, a German silver pin. You see the, the soldier here on the upper, upper right wearing it, uh, depicting the gamecock. Now, a cool story has it that their colonel, Colonel William Creighton, was known to inspire his men in battle by getting up on a prominent place where he could be seen, sticking his hands in his armpits, flapping his arms and crowing like a rooster. He was actually shot off a rock at Taylor Ridge, a battle that took place after Gettysburg, Ringgold, Georgia is the battle, um, doing that very thing. He was standing on a rock crowing like a rooster when a Confederate shot him. So interesting story, but that's why there's a gamecock on the back of the Ohio Monument. This is the 40th New York known as the Mozart Regiment. It actually represents three states, not one. It represents New York, Massachusetts, and Pennsylvania, because companies from all three of those states made up this regiment. But it's, it's designated the 40th New York. Notice that when it was first erected, it was not on a base. This is down in Devil's, near Devil's Den, right at the intersection of Warren Avenue and Crawford Avenue. So it was supposed to depict how the soldiers fought among the boulders. And it, was, it did a great job of doing that, but so much so that sometimes people missed looking or missed, missed finding the monument among the boulders. So at one point it was badly damaged in uh, an episode of vandalism. And when it was repaired, it was placed up on a pretty high prominent pedestal so that it could be picked out among the boulders of Devil's Den. This is a, a statue of a, of a chaplain who accompanied the Irish Brigade to Gettysburg. He is going to come here and um, give final absolution to his troops on July 2nd as they were sent into battle. And he was honored in the action he took. They say he got on a rock. He was a rather, rather diminutive figure. So he stood on a rock to give absolution. Whether it is that exact rock that appears at Gettysburg is unknown. But in any case, the depiction of that event is shown at Gettysburg on Hancock Avenue by Father Corby standing there on a rock giving absolution. An identical monument was dedicated down on the campus of Notre Dame because Father Corby after the war had a two term two terms as president of Notre Dame. Uh, that was in the 1880s, it was a split. It wasn't a contiguous term, but in any case, or consecutive term, but in any case, a monument matching the one we have at Gettysburg stands on a boulder at Notre Dame, but the boulder it stands on was a boulder brought from Devil's Den. I tried to track a couple of other boulders that left our battlefield, and there are a number of them that are scattered throughout the country that honor certain things, like there's one um, in a Shemokin Cemetery in the Veterans Circle. There's one at um, Kennedy's, or sorry, President Lincoln's birthplace, State Park or National Park, National Historic Site. 
There's one in Philadelphia marking the spot where Satterley Hospital was a U.S. hospital during the war, took care of many, many wounded Union troops. Uh, there's one mark, marking there has a plaque on it, and it sits where Satterley Hospital used to stand. So um, this is an interesting one on the left. It's the New York um, Bayer Zouaves, and its story is unique in that this particular regiment was recruited from the, the Volunteer Fire Department of New York City. And in honor of their service, they were kept on the active duty rolls until they returned. Obviously, many of them did not return. And after they returned from the war, they were paid for the first time. So it's kind of the beginning of the paid fire service in New York City, but it's also depicting the, the firemen and then the same man in his role as soldier. And they were quoted as saying that it was no more dangerous to serve on a battlefield than it was to serve as a firefighter in the city of New York. On the right is an interesting monument depicting, it's honoring the 116th Pennsylvania that served as part of the Irish Brigade. They were recruited in Philadelphia and their Colonel Mulholland suggested the art for the monument. And it does not depict a soldier in the 116th Pennsylvania. It depicts a soldier that Mulholland saw after the battle was over as they stepped out of their battle line to look at the field and there in front of a fence was the fallen figure of a very young soldier. And Mulholland said he looked so peaceful, he looked like he was asleep. And this figure haunted Mulholland's dreams for years. And so he wanted that to be the depiction that they saw. There's the the remnant of the fence and the fallen soldier by the wall. So th there's actually a story told that he had nightmares about this until it was placed on the monument and then his nightmares were relieved. So there's two monuments that did not happen. One of them was a monument that was supposed to stand at the angle representing the, the, um, the survivors of Pickett's division. The story has it that they were they were invited to come to an 1887 reunion hosted by the Philadelphia Brigade. And when they were invited, they were reluctant to come. They thought the Union veterans were going to mock them. But eventually the Union veterans, you know, kept writing to them and saying, please come to honor our, our service. So they agreed to come. But a little bit before the actual um, reunion, they let it be known in a letter that they were bringing with them a monument since there was so much monumentation going on at Gettysburg they were bringing one to honor Pickett's survivors or Pickett's division in their action at Gettysburg this information alarmed the union veterans and they 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 said you know what you can't really bring that and put it here because your intention is to put it in the angle and our monument rules explicitly say that your monument has to stand in your line and your line is over there on seminary ridge so you would have to buy land over there to put up their uh, put up your monument well the confederate veterans got really upset and they weren't going to come until the union veterans offered to put up a monument where Armistead fell. So it's interesting that the monument where Armistead fell that stands inside the Union line was actually placed there by Union veterans, not Confederate veterans. And it was done as an act of reconciliation. Before we end that story though, what became of that Confederate monument that they were going to bring to Gettysburg? Well, it was repurposed as the monument to General George Pickett in Hollywood Cemetery. The bottom engraving shows you them dedicating that in October of 1888, the following year, over General Pickett's grave in Hollywood. So can you imagine looking at the, the huge monument there? And it was huge. You see the crowd in the, in the illustration. Can you imagine that standing inside the Union line at Gettysburg? Wow. Uh, another one that did not happen was the one to General Longstreet. General Longstreet's widow was quite put out that he did not have an equestrian monument at Gettysburg. So she set out to raise funds for it. And it started in 1839 or 1939. She started a, a fundraising campaign. She went out to a lot of places, to a lot of veterans organizations and, and presentations. She gave presentations at these veterans organizations and even went far enough to designate the ground and to have a ceremony, a groundbreaking ceremony at Gettysburg. Now, the plot of ground is not where the, the current Longstreet Monument is located. The piece of ground that they are dedicating in this picture is actually in the shadow of Big Round Top right across the road from the Alabama Monument, because that depicts General Longstreet's command of that, that, that first 
Confederate Corps. It goes from roughly where he is in the woods today to where the end of the Confederate line is. That was all his terrain, but that's where the monument was supposed to be dedicated. Here's actually a picture of the spot. Right here would be the equestrian monument to General Longstreet. What derailed poor Mrs. Longstreet's efforts was World War II. She was not able to raise the funds for the monument. And when you look at this monument, it's pretty awesome. It kind of fits in with a lot of, the, in fact, it's a little more grandiose than all of the other equestrian monuments on the field, but it is up on a pedestal, has all this engraving work on it, and you show he's victorious, lifting his hat. And of course, what we ended up with that came along many, many, many decades later by the Longstreet Society was the one you see on the right, and it was not placed where Mrs. Longstreet had um, dedicated the ground. So Interestingly, the artist who did the, the modern one is aware of the model for the other one that's in the park archives, but chose to do his own interpretation. Now, Confederate monuments on the field, we'll just do this real quick. I only picked out a few of the more interesting ones. This one is, of course, in North Carolina. It is depicting color, uh, the color bearer surrounded by other soldiers stepping off for their part in Pickett's Charge of July 3rd, the Long Street, you know, the it's not Pickett's Charge, it's the Pickett Pettigrew Trimble Assault. And the artist who created it was most famous for um, Mount Rushmore, as you see here depicted on the right. And this is the gentleman, his name was Gutson Borglum. However, he did the North Carolina, North Carolina Monument well before he did Mount Rushmore. Rushmore was in the late 30s and into the early 1940s, and the North Carolina was 1929. Uh, it's actually the color bearer on the monument to North Carolina is representing a man who wasn't in the battle. All the other faces were real soldiers from North Carolina, but the man whose face is on the colors, the color bearer, is Oren Randolph Smith, who happened to be the designer of the very first national colors for the Confederacy. So he actually flew that flag before the Civil War ever broke out. The Alabama Monument is interesting. It's one of the earlier ones. It is 1933, and it was placed here by the daughters of the, um, the UDC, the, da the United Daughters of the Confederacy. It depicts the spirit of Alabama in the front, and on the left is a wounded soldier passing off his accoutrements to the soldier on the right who's about to go into battle. But it's interesting that the face of the soldier going into battle is very reminiscent of George Washington, which is no surprise. George Washington was the father of the American Revolution, the fight for independence. To the Confederacy, the Civil War is their second war for independence. It is why George Washington is depicted on that monument. And by the way, there's a lot of cool um, flora in the back of this monument that looks a lot like Laurel. This is the proposed monument to Tennessee. I say proposed because it is not what the Tennessee Monument ended up looking like. But interestingly, Felix de Weldon was a designer. Now, if you know Felix de Weldon, he is also the man who created the Iwo Jima Monument that graces um, Arlington. So it looks extremely reminiscent of that monument. However, it was supposed to be in bronze. And then in the 1940s, as the funds were being raised, there was um, a problem with the funding. Some say there was some money that was um, misappropriated. And so they never did get their monument until 1980, 1983. And this is what the finished, the real monument looks like. It's got the same figures, but they're just carved on a, on a huge slab of polished granite. The three stars, even though there were three regiments, fought for Tennessee. That's what the three figures represent. The three stars stand for the three landscape features of the state of Tennessee, which was the plains, the rivers, and the mountains. So uh, it stands on a pedestal that you can see has the outline of the 16th state of the nation's Tennessee. So it's 16 feet wide. This kind of symbolism runs rampant through these monuments at Gettysburg, which is really neat and really cool. And you really need to read up on them and study them to find out how cool it really is. So this monument, is um, Felix de Weldon himself died in 2003 at the age of 96, but his most famous work was actually um, the one at Iwo Jima. He actually had 1200 sculptures on seven continents and the seventh continent was his statue of Bird, of General Admiral Bird up in Antarctica.
This is the Virginia Monument, the very first Confederate monument to grace the battlefield of Gettysburg. It was finished in 1917, but the pedestal was actually placed in 1912. And there was a lot of controversy about its location. It ended up on Seminary Ridge because the rules said your monument needs to grace your battle line. So uh, it was very controversial. The veterans that were still alive in 1913 or 1912 didn't really want this Confederate monument or any others. It finally got the bronze pieces added to it and it was dedicated. But in fact, one of the people in the dedication ceremony was General Lee's granddaughter and the Confederate veterans, the Virginia Confederate veterans are the ones that dedicated it. It has, of course, the top is the statue of, or the, equest the equestrian statue of General Robert E. Lee on his favorite horse, Traveler. Um, that it was said to be one of the best likenesses of both horse and rider, in part because there was a skeletal remains of a traveler able to be studied and measured to translate then into the monument, but also the likeness of General Lee, there was a life mask used of him that was done by Valentine. So a very popular monument. Uh, one change was asked to be made when that monument was dedicated, and that was there was a Confederate battle flag there behind the figures, and it was changed to the Virginia flag, not because the Confederate battle flag in 1917 was so controversial. It was because it was representing the state of Virginia. So uh, that sometimes gets lost in the interpretation simply because General Lee was it seems to be who is being honored since he is the most prominent person on the monument. Now, there's one enduring myth of the battlefield I'd like to address before we close this presentation, and that is the myth of the horse's hooves. And that myth has been around almost as long as there's been equestrian monuments on the battlefield of Gettysburg. However, now first I'll give you the myth. The myth says that you can tell the fate of the rider by looking at the position of the horse's hooves. If all four hooves are on the ground, like the upper left, nothing happened to the rider. He survived the battle. On the um, bottom, you have one hoof off, and that is General Hancock, and he was wounded. So that's what that's supposed to represent. And the one on the bottom right is General Reynolds, who we all know was mortally wounded here at the Battle of Gettysburg, and he has two hooves up. So the formula is supposed to say one up, made it through, two up, got wounded, three up, died. However, three of our greatest equestrian monuments on the field were done by a man named Henry Kirk Bush Brown. He is the nephew of a famous Lincoln sculptor, Henry Kirk. Brown, Henry Kirk Bush, sorry. Um, in any case, he made three of the monuments and he did not ever allude to that formula. So when he visited the battlefield in 1915, he was met by some members of the War Department who questioned him at the Meade Monument. They said, tell us about the formula. And his answer, he just wanted them to all look different. There was no formula. He said, I never thought of that. My idea was to show in one case, a horse in action and another a horse at rest, no significant whatsoever to the fate of the riders. So even though the, the, the myth is, is being perpetuated ad nauseum, it isn't really true. Sorry if I hurt anybody's feelings on that, but it's my duty as a guide to tell the truth and that is the truth. So with that, um, I'm going to turn this back to Abby, who can close this program. Abby? Okay, here we go. My, my button wouldn't press the first time. Thank you so much, Sue. That was awesome. I love hearing all those stories. My, my favorite one's always the guy with the game cock with the rooster. Yeah, me too. So that was a good one. I was glad you included that one. And thank you to those of y'all that were viewing tonight and um, watching about these monuments. If you have questions for Sue, um, put them in the comments down below and then I'll make sure that she sees them so that she can um, answer any of your questions for anybody who's wondering anything. And chances are we're gonna be doing more programming here soon. So I have a feeling we'll be seeing everyone again. Uh, again, Sue, thank you so very much for joining us tonight. It's been a pleasure having you. My pleasure as well.